gentlemen, I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and this is State of Mind. We would like to thank the Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel for their partnership in this season's production. The Youth Channel is a cable and multimedia platform that focuses on highlighting media created by youth for youth while providing a pipeline for action. Continuing on our two-part series entitled The Corner of the Court, we're looking at the importance of male advocates in relation to female success across a variety of industries. Today's topic will focus on the male perspective, Back with us today is the creator of the Corner of the Court Project, psychologist and organizational leadership specialist, Roshana Bide. Roshana, thanks for joining us again on State of Mind. Thanks for having me back. So Great I, to be here. I had such a good time on part one of our two-part series. <laughs> so in order to level set our audience, take a second and just remind us, what is the Corner of the Court? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, um, the Corner of the Court is a program that I started which allows for women to make an intentional shout out to a male ally or male advocate that has supported her in her professional life or in her life in some way. Um, it's a metaphor for a tennis court and it is it allows the woman to kind of be still the, the feature of the story but she's really really intentional about explaining how helpful her male champion and her male advocate has been. The reason we do this and the reason that I tell these women's stories is because it's really important for men to see that their actions really do make a difference. So I got a chance to check out the corner of the court.com and first of all I was absolutely blown away by the profiles. My question to you though is how does your project actually reach men? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question because it's a, a bunch of women's faces that are telling stories of their own success. Right. And um, I think we do it in two ways. One is the women are telling stories of men. And so the, the intentionality there is a little bit of it's kind of competitive to show like, you know, here's a great successful woman willingly telling a story about her male champion. Right. Will she be telling, who's, who's the woman that's gonna be telling one about you? Right. So there's a little bit of that. And also the fact that it is a sports metaphor brings men into the conversation about mm -hmm. diversity, inclusion, which are, can, either they've often not been invo invited to have an intentional conversation about it, or they're afraid to say the wrong thing. Doing it in a sports metaphor allows for men to be involved in the discussion in a very unique way. Now, before you and I met, I had never heard of the concept of a male ally, so I'll plead ignorance. And I'm pretty sure most of my male fellow XY chromosome holders felt the same way. So how do males wake up to this concept? Yeah. How do we wake them up and make sure they're aware of it? So this is exactly why I started the project, because I had my own male ally. I have many male allies. The first one that I chose to speak about when I spoke about my research was my older brother, mm -hmm. who was my tennis coach, which is kind of why the corner of the court right. as a metaphor was born. And I had elected to tell this story to kick off um, kind of a keynote about my research, about the importance of male advocates, in front of an audience of mixed gender and all sports um, broadcasters and mm -hmm. athletes. Um, this is out in Los Angeles in front of Fox, ESPN. And so I wanted to make this topic really relevant for the men. So I told them the story about me um, being the only girl on a team of um, all boys and how my brother was my champion. The reason I share this, Krishna, is because it took me 25 years to tell that story on stage. And it took me 25 years, about two hours before telling that speech, to call my brother and say, hey, by the way, I'm going to be telling a story about you. And right. he had no idea that he had made that kind of impact on really? me. So I do think that it is in the women's hands for this particular topic in this particular mm -hmm. way to be able to encourage men that their, in, their, in, their actions do make an impact. Mm -hmm. Certainly women don't need to shoulder all of the responsibility for this topic, but um, I do think that that's why our, our project exists, so that women, or so that men, excuse me, that have been advocates and didn't even realize it, right. now they can start to realize it. Now in your research, you've talked to men across the industries in corporate America. You've also talked to young men in the college setting. So yeah. I want to bifurcate the two populists, so to speak. Talk to me about some of the feedback and insights you were able to gain from college-aged individuals um, and their perspectives in 2018. Yeah, it's a great question because it is different. Um, men that I've been able to interview that are much more senior positionally also have a little bit less to lose mm. because they've reached an apex right. where they can be very generous with their advocacy. Right. Um, so now if we go to the other side to your question, which are men, young men that are just starting out in their careers. Um, interestingly, th the most um, ready 
that they've been able to, the most ready examples that they've been able to give me about why they are or aren't male advocates, they really are and they just don't realize it, right. um, are relationships with sisters and relationships with their mothers. Mm. So um, that is a fiber or a thread that actually holds regardless of whether I'm talking to an 18 year old or a 58 year old. Right. Because they're really readily, maybe not, maybe not right off the bat, but if I probe them a little bit as a psychologist and have a conversation, then they are able to say how a, a relationship with a female, usually blood relative, has influenced them. The other difference between though, th the difference between the younger men, of course it's a different era that they're growing up in. Um, many of them have more frequent, they've more frequently seen mothers that have worked um, outside the home right. and balanced um, a career. The other thing um, about that is there's a lot more uh, readiness to talk about this topic through college clubs and organizations. Sure. So certainly from a business school standpoint, so this isn't really undergrad, but um, Stanford School of Business, Graduate School of Business, um, Wharton at UPenn, they have male advocacy groups. So mm -hmm. Wharton, the Wharton 22s um, influence based on the, the percentage of the pay gap sure. that they want to close. They're, they're a group of dudes that want to be um, spreading the importance of gender equality in the workplace and mm -hmm. in business. Um, so there's a lot of resources that young men have on college campuses, but they also have the opportunity to create those themselves as well, which I didn't see certainly 20 years ago when I was in college. Sure. Um, one of the other observations I was able to kind of make when I spoke to a lot of the younger men that are freshmen, sophomore, juniors at university is they're really, really woke to the topic of sexual assault. Mm. And many of them, when we're talking about kind of organizing groups on campus, many of them um, from the athletic standpoint or fraternities um, are doing things like walk a mile in her shoes right. to raise awareness for what a man, how he can have empathy for what women go through when it relates to sexual assault. Um, I think we can extend those types of behaviors to talk about gender equality um, mm. in general. So sticking with the topic of younger men, does social media play a part in any of this? I mean, they're so in tune with it. It's a generation that grew up on the internet and social media. Is that an avenue or a platform that can help in terms of advocating for male allies and waking them up, so to speak? I hope so, I hope so. I mean, that's certainly our project, Corner of the Court, was, was born on the internet. Mm -hmm. It was born online right. and through social media. Um, and I think that's from a, the kind of the positive reinforcement and the positive competition of, of sharing stories, then social media is a great place to do that. Interestingly though, I do think that social media aside, the very natural relationships that men have mm -hmm. with their sisters, young men have with their sisters, with their mothers, is what um, is the catalyst for them wanting to care about this topic. Right. So I want to take an analogy that I think is very helpful in the world of sports. Um, you look at like a boxer or a, a tennis player. It's good to have a partner, uh, a sparring partner, someone to play against, to really force you to push yourself. And I think that's something that's allowed people to really achieve accomplishments far beyond their expectations. In the example of male allies, I'm a 20-year-old college student, and I have a 20-year-old female college friend. We're both applying for the same job. Can I still be an ally, even though I'm competing for the same opportunity as her? Um, yeah, because you've been an ally, if you, if you are friends with her, yeah. you've been an ally with her through grades, you've been an ally with her through dating, you've been an ally with her through lots of other things. So I would actually ask the question, why now as it comes to applying for a job right. or when you're in the workforce getting the promotion, yeah. does it become an issue? Because actually you've been competing in right. a really friendly way this whole time. Okay, so that actually answers my question. I think it's important for our audience to understand being an ally is not situational, it's actually over longevity of the relationship. Yeah. So let's take that one step further. You're in the workplace. You're middle management, you know, you've got maybe a decade under your belt. You've been an ally for someone uh, who's maybe a couple years behind you, but all of a sudden there's an opportunity where they could potentially equal you in terms of yeah. title potentially succeed you in title and pay. Yeah. What's to prevent males from backing off in that moment? You had mentioned earlier in the show yeah. that the ones that you've spoken to are established in their careers. Yeah, absolutely. But well, what about the ones who still have, quote, something to lose? Something to lose, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, I think that, again, I talk a lot about self-reflection and mm -hmm. self-confidence, and my whole project is to build self-confident male allies right. so that they feel so 
secure that they don't wrestle with this. Right. Um, what you've put, what you've posed happens all the time with same gender mentoring relationships sure. as right. well. So a lot of times I can put myself from a woman mentoring a younger woman. There is always that threat mm -hmm. of threat really um, of them rising up and surpassing you, but that's what good leaders do. They groom the next generation, um, mm -hmm. regardless of sure, gender. Sure. So an observation I've made in my time in financial services, so it might be specifically to that industry, and I know that we're talking about the male perspective, but I say that in the context of, I have seen male allies. Yeah. Um, I've seen them support females through the world of Wall Street. What I didn't see as often was accomplished female oh. executives support females that were younger in their career in a more overt capacity. Am I yeah. seeing one situation in a niche environment or is that actually something you've observed as well? Well, I think um, from, so a couple things, Th that is your experience and mm -hmm. what you've observed. Um, we do hear often that it's the, w the women are kind of, don't take wim other women under their wing. Um, I will offer potentially a couple of options, one is a woman might not have been reaching her hand down to you, but you've had lots of men reach their hands down to you. So right. that right there um, yeah, might um, kind of cloud what it is around how you see women mentors. Um, let's go with it though and say that there are, that in your experience at the firm that you worked for, you didn't see a lot of it. And let's assume that women at that firm weren't reaching their hands down. That could be for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, sheer numbers is just part of it, right. that for every one, one woman at the top um, over the last 25, 30 years, there's 10 men. And for one woman to reach her hand down to this many women, it's a lot of added strain on top of um, women generally having to do a lot more of the office housework type things. Right. Um, so I think some of that's just an energy thing and probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't ascribe that to anything mal intent. Okay, so let's take that one step further. And the reason I bring this up is I work in management. I have a team of about 20 people underneath me in my day job. So when I think about what you just said, in 2018 where we're supposed to be, you'd like to think a lot more enlightened in terms of what individuals face as their careers progress. How much is it upon myself to know these type of data points that you just spouted off? to have a better appreciation for what it's like to be a female versus a male mm -hmm. executive or middle manager. Because I think, I know the answer already, it makes for a better manager and it mm -hmm. makes for a better team environment and for a better and more productive company. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a lot of that knowledge being narr you know, narrated across most firms. Yeah, yeah, and when it is narrated, it is done around exactly the way you've described it. No, you know the business case. You know mm -hmm. that diverse teams are more profitable, right. et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I really, I, I take real exception when I see that that's what we lead with mm -hmm. around why we make the case for diversity, because it is all of those things, and yet it's not what galvanizes people to get excited or get them to care. Right. So um, the answer is yes, you should care. Yes, every man, whether he's in a position of leadership or just starting out or wherever he is, yes, he should care. How do we get them to care? Right. And I. I take the perspective being A, a psychologist, but then also B, being part of corner of the court, which is we don't talk about profitability and we don't talk about the uh, competitive advantage you get. There's lots of people that are doing that and there's lots of systemic change that's looking to happen, um, bringing more women on boards, et cetera. Right. I really wanna look at the individual. And if a guy is even asking the question, like how much should I care? It means he cares a little. Right. And most likely he has a natural relationship that he can anchor around with a woman that he can say, oh, wow, I have actually, I do value her and I want to see that she's um, treated fairly in the workplace. And that's that fr it's from those points that I do the work that I do. So we talked in our previous episode, you've worked across a multitude of industries, consumer groups, consulting, fashion, financial services. Yeah. I'm a young, 22 year old male coming out of college, my first job, entry level. I'm self aware enough to know that I want to be an ally, or at least I care enough to ask the question. How do I get off on the right start in my new company? Is there an area that I can go to that the way you, Penn, and Stanford have these yeah. organizations that I can do the same thing in my own corporate environment? Yeah, so um, I, the ideal answer would be yes, there's already an established group. Um, that actually might not be the ideal answer because. Yeah. 
equally ideal would be there is no group and a young gentleman starts one. Um, how can he do that? Well, certainly most groups have employee, most companies have employee resource groups um, and they usually have a women's employee resource group. That's a great place to start. Um, I think now more than ever, it's becoming part of the national conversation mm -hmm. that men need to have a role in gender equality um, for women. Right. So it's an easier conversation to have than let's say even five years ago when I was researching this. I also think that it's really important that guys understand that they don't need to lose their sense of brotherhood to talk about topics like this. So certainly so being- So talk to me about that. What do you mean by brotherhood? Let's yeah, just get right on the Yeah, other. absolutely. No, well, you know, because I think we were talking about um, college campuses right. and I'm thinking about the fraternity guys and mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, just kind of even in, you know, as a 38 year old woman, my buddies who get together with the guys, um, you can preserve a lot of that and still at the same time be talking about topics that are um, inclusive and also benefit you as a man. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I say this because in the examples that I gave to you, um, a young man kind of entering the workforce, if he wants to start, he can kind of do it as part of a wing of a women's right. re resource group. The most successful grassroots efforts I've seen have been groups of guys that come together mm -hmm. and talk about this. Okay. And they do it over breakfast. They do it sometimes sponsored with kind of a senior man, but it's always all men, so I'm not in the room. I just hear about them afterwards. Sure. Um, but there's a lot of enthusiasm to talk about how, yeah, we're, we're guys and we, many of them are fathers, so mm -hmm. they talk about the relationships with their daughters. You've mentioned this before yourself, the type of world you want to see your daughter grow up it right. into. Um, and also it allows them to say what roles they want as fathers with paternity leave or um, bringing kind of their whole authentic selves to work. That's a whole opportunity that um, makes men great leaders, but also just great people to be with. Right. Um, so that's what I mean by you don't have to lose your brotherhood. You can have a lot of these conversations are the most effective when they're done in male only groups. So we alluded to parenting a little bit in the previous episode. I'm gonna go um, a little bit farther with that narrative in this question to you. Parents as a group, so mother and father. We're obviously focusing on the, on the male perspective, but what type of things can they start from day one, you know, once they have their own family, so to speak, to really mm -hmm. foster that sense, whether they have a boy or a girl, if they have both in their own family, to continue to push the idea of male allies and make it almost seamless, like it's part of the way the world should be? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question um, because I haven't in my research looked at the role of the okay. mother. Okay. Um, and it might be because I have such a great relationship, I have a great relationship with both my parents. Right. Um, but really, um, I looked at sibling relationships as kind of the, the cohort with which you kind of come into the mm -hmm. world and you grow the longest with mm -hmm. as the inspiration for the work. But certainly, um, a lot of the relationships we even have in the workplace a lot of them mirror our relationships with our parents. That's true. So it's a really great question. Um, from a gender equality standpoint, I would say for fathers in particular to be really conscious of, um, of what it means to be an ally and what those roles are. And then again, for the women, yeah. it's if, if your husband is doing something really positive and he's coaching your daughter's soccer team, right acknowledge that yeah. um, because again it's this kind of I call it unconscious advocacy which is all these behaviors that men are doing and I think the other point that, that men are doing that they might not necessarily realize are productive behaviors I think the other thing that's a really great um, a great uh, effect of the question that you asked is a lot of times men and women go to work and they're in no significant position of power to mm -hmm. make big systemic change. I can't hire 10 women, even right. if I wanted to, right. but they can make an impact at home. Right. And that's the big, um, the big thing. So things like, so little things like coaching your soccer team, um, doing things with intentionality, I think are really important. And so the reason I brought up, just to give you full yeah. uh, uh, perspective, is we did an episode uh, a couple seasons ago called Eastern Parent, Western Student. The idea that you think of you know, immigrant parents more so, who are very much about education. I can use my own example. Uh, growing up, my father believed that education was the path that would get you to a better life. And he didn't care if my sister was a boy or a girl, and that would be the same for me. He felt, you're going to learn, you're going to compete, you're going to be the best at what you do, and you're going to win academically, and of course also on, on the sports field, so to speak. I know you, that you said you haven't really looked at parents mm. so much, but is there a cultural aspect to male allies that we see in maybe one culture more than another? 
Yeah, the, the, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's what the the um, general um, cultural norms would be for different cultures. However, um, I do think that the behaviors that an Eastern parent shows or a Western parent shows in this, I'm, I grew up mm. with the similar, um, mm. similar messages. Those have effects on us that are, are the same. So I would look at my father and say, he was my soccer coach. Mm -hmm. He enabled my brother to be um, who my brother was to be such a champion of, of his daughter. Even if my father wanted me to get married when I immediately right out of university and had a lot of traditional thinking, mm -hmm. there was a lot of kind of woke, Right. untraditional Eastern thinking that he had been doing because, again, he's an unconscious advocate for gender equality. And, you know, I don't know that my father would ever have called himself a feminist, mm, but he interesting. is. Well, let's take that thought then and now apply it to the current generation, the one that maybe is a little bit more woke. Last question to you. What advice would you give to the college environment, specifically to the male perspective, in terms of what they can do to continue to wake up to the concept of being a male ally? Yeah, I would, I would like to take it back to this, this thing of you don't need to sacrifice your brotherhood or feel threatened that you're going to be jockeying for a position um, with a, a less qualified woman. I think all of those stereotypes um, or the myths that people spend a lot of effort to, to debunk and show that it's not like that. Um, guys I in their college years are in a prime place to rewrite the story. Right. Um, and write it according to the terms that they want. And so I would say very much um, really reflect, I talked about self-reflection mm -hmm. for women. The very first article I wrote about this topic that I put out on LinkedIn was about the importance of reflective practice for men. Mm. And it was, so I talked about it in the previous segment for women just as they're going into the world to understand kind of why they want, why they're picking the careers that they pick, et cetera. For male allies, it is equally important because it allows for guys to see that they've probably been doing good ally behavior yeah. that they haven't necessarily realized. So that was actually the first article that I wrote and put out there about this topic. Mm -hmm. And it also gives men permission to take some time and think about what kind of leader and what kind of man they wanna be. They're gonna be husbands you know, right. in 10 years. It just makes them um, really productive citizens of society. Well, I think what I'm getting from a male perspective from this conversation is that being a male ally on either side, being the ally itself or being the recipient, it's all very empowering. And that's ultimately w the sentiment you want to get out of this, is that both sides feel like they're coming away a little farther ahead in life than they were before. Absolutely. And there's great men on our website. I mean, Bruce Arians, who coach is the, the head coach of the Arizona, Arizona Cardinals, Cardinals. Um, Jen Welter, who he hired as the first woman to coach in the NFL, he's, he's one of our featured allies. So there are men out there that are doing this. Um, of course, Bruce Arians is in a great position of power. Right. So too can, can yeah. any man be. So we could do this topic for a lot longer. I would love we to. Have to, we, have to <laughs> we have to end the episode. How can people find you? How can they find Corner of the Court? Oh, well, Corner of the Court, the website, cornerofthecourt.com. Um, we have all of our women's stories there. And then we retweet and share on Instagram and Facebook all of the women's stories as well. So Corner of the Court is the, is the brand. And certainly um, anyone, if they want to reach out to me about specific behaviors that they can do, um, again, they don't have to be big grand things. They can be really small behaviors. Um, I'm really happy to be contacted. Well, we're really happy to have you, Rashana. Thank you so much. And we definitely look forward to having you back on State of Mind. Thank you so much. On that note, that'll wrap up our show for today. I'd like to thank Rashana Bide for joining us and offering her unique perspectives on this very important topic. We'd also like to thank the Youth Channel's team for their support in this production. If you'd like to learn more about Manhattan Neighbor Network's youth channel, please visit mnn.org slash youth. Additionally, if you like what you saw in today's episode, please feel free to like, share, comment, and subscribe on the following social media platforms at the end of the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night.